Welcome along, fellow strange historians. This time around, I'm going to be reading a vintage article about serial killer H.H. H. Holmes. So sit back and pour yourself a cup of coffee or a tankard of tea or a mug of mead or a chalice of cider or a flagon filled with any beverage of your choice. And join your fellow strange historians and I here at the fireplace. So what I'm going to do is just be reading from this vintage article. It was published on May 14th of 1896. And I think it's called The Virginian. And here's the headline. The Valley of Death. Herman W. Mudgett shakes off this mortal coil wearing a hempen necktie. And then the next title is One of the Worst Criminals Known. And then following that, it says he possessed... Not the binstering braggadocio, but a calm demeanor, compelled by a will of iron. Slept well, ate heartily, and was careful in the extreme as to his toilet. Alrighty, let's get rolling. Philadelphia, May 7. Murderer Herman W. Mudgett, alias H.H. H. Holmes, was hanged this morning in the county prison for the killing of of Benjamin F. Pietzel. The drop fell. It's actually spelled Pietzel here, but it's also been spelled Pitizel in the past. I'm just going to go with how it's written here. The drop fell at 10, 12 o'clock, and 20 minutes later, he was pronounced dead by the prison officials. Dr. Sharp and Dr. Butcher. The execution was in every way entirely devoid of any sensational features. To the last, he was self-possessed and cool, even to the extent of giving a word of advice to Assistant Superintendent Richardson as the latter was arranging the final details. He died as he had lived, unconcerned and thoughtless, apparently, of the future, even with the recollection still before him of the recent confession in which he admitted the killing of a score of persons of both sexes and in all parts of the country. He refuted everything, and almost his last words were a point-blank denial of any crimes committed, except the death of two women at his hands by malpractice, as the murder of several members of the Pietzel family. He denied all complicity, particularly of the father, for whose death he stated he was suffering the penalty. Then, with the prayers of the spiritual attendants still sounding in his ears, and with a few low words to those about the trap sprung, and beyond a few incidental postmortem details, the execution which culminated one of the worst crimes known to criminology, was ended. While the exact time of his execution was as usual unannounced, it was generally supposed that the hour would be about 10 o'clock. Two hours before that time, however, those who were to attend began arriving, but admission to the prison was denied everyone except to those officials in direct touch with the institution until nine o'clock. The gates were then opened and the four score or more having tickets pressed into the inner court. Sheriff Clements had preceded the crowd and was awaiting the arrival of those comprising his jury that they might be sworn. The jury comprised six physicians and a like number from other walks of life, all prominent in their respective stations. And then actually lists all the people that showed up that were, I guess, the sheriff and the jury. There's no need for me to read their names. So let me continue. Mr. Wood, one of the sheriff's jury, was also a member of the jury that convicted Holmes. Many prominent men were in attendance, several from other cities. Lawyer Rattan, who conducted the defense of Holmes during the trial, was early at the prison. But 
He had been preceded by Reverend Father Daly and Father McPake, who administered the last rites of the church to the condemned man. They arrived shortly after six o'clock and only after a few minutes after Holmes had arisen. Last evening, they remained with him until 1030. The death watch was then being kept by Keeper Weaver. Weaver said that Holmes retired about midnight and slept soundly during the time until six o'clock. Holmes greeted the priest warmly, but with no show of undue emotion and with the same air of self-possession that has marked his conduct throughout the entire case. They were come to administer the sacrament of communion and every possible facility for privacy was extended by Superintendent Perkins of the prison. For nearly two hours, they remained in the cell within and then were almost immediately succeeded by Lawyer Rattan, the legal advisor of Holmes. Pleasantly, also, he greeted him. While discussing his affairs, breakfast was served and he seemed to heartily enjoy the meal. It was substantial but plain, consisting of eggs, toast, and coffee, which were taken with an evident relish. And this is a quote. He enjoyed it more than I could, even though only his attorney, remarked Mr. Rattan after leaving the cell. And then there's another quote. He is the most cool and possessed of all in any way connected with the case, end quote. The remark seemed in no wise exaggerated. Every story was to the same effect, and to the end he maintained the same stoicism. It was not the blustering braggadocio, but the calm demeanor and quiet bearing that are compelled by a will of iron. When the morning meal was ended, and shortly before nine o'clock, Holmes prepared to dress himself. Contrary to the general custom, he refused to don a new suit, but arrayed himself in trousers, vest, and cutaway coat of some dark mixed goods of a pepper and salt effect that had been worn by him frequently before. Even in this, he was careful, giving every attention to even the most minute details of his toilet. Collar and necktie were, of course, not worn, but their place was taken by a white handkerchief knotted carelessly about the neck. At 10 o'clock sounded the march to the gallows, was taken up and direct directly preceded by Sheriff Clements and Superintendent Perkins, Holmes stepped on the trap. On the right was Father Daly, to the left, Father McPake, and bringing up the rear were Lawyer Rattan and Assistant Superintendent Richardson. The little party stood for a moment looking down, and then, in response to a sign from one of those beside him, Holmes stepped forward and spoke. Pallid, naturally, after his incarceration, there was no other evidence of any fear or disquiet. He spoke slowly and with measured attention to every word. A trifle low at first, but louder as he proceeded until every word was distinctly audible. And here's what he said, quote, Gentlemen, he said, I have very few words to say. In fact, I would make no statement at this time, except that by not speaking, I would appear to acquiesce in life in my execution. I only want to say that the extent of my wrongdoings in taking human life consisted in the deaths of two women, they having died at my hand as the result of criminal operation. I wish to also state, however, so that there will be no misunderstanding hereafter, I am not guilty 
of taking the lives of any of the Pietzel family, the three children or father, Benjamin F. Pitzel. Of those deaths, I am now convicted and for which I am today to be hanged. That is all. End quote. As he ceased speaking, he stepped back and kneeling between Fathers Daly and McPaik, joined with them in silent prayer for a minute or two. Again, standing, he shook the hands of those around him and then signified his readiness for the end. Coolest of the entire party, he even went to the extreme of suggesting to the assistant, Superintendent Richardson, that the latter need not hurry himself. And here's his quote. Take your time, don't bungle it, end quote. He remarked, as the official exhibited some little haste, the evident outcome of nervousness. These were almost his last words. The cap was adjusted, a low-toned query, quote, are you ready, end quote, and an equally low-toned response of, quote, yes, goodbye, end quote. And the trap was sprung. The neck was not broken, and there were a few convulsive twitches of the limbs that continued for about 10 minutes. And here's a quote. But he suffered nope after the drop, end quote, said Dr. Scott, the prison physician. The trap was sprung at precisely 10, 12 and a half, and 15 minutes later, Holmes was pronounced dead, though the body was not cut down until 1045. After the body had been lowered from the scaffold and placed upon the stretcher and the stiffened knot finally loosened and the noose removed, the black cap was taken off. The face was a bit little distorted. It was slightly discolored and the eyes were half open. The lips were drawn back and the teeth protruded. A bruise and an abrasion around the neck where the rope had tightened was visible above the coat collar. After the body had been viewed by the physicians and the manner of death determined, the stretcher was wheeled out of the corridor into the jail yard. Here, he was placed into an ordinary cheap pine coffin. One noticeable thing about the coffin was that it was wide enough and deep enough to have held two men of Holmes's size. The coffin was put aboard an undertaker's wagon and conveyed to the Roman Catholic Church of the Holy Cross. The only persons at the cemetery were the undertaker and his assistants, two grave diggers, two watchmen, and a couple of newspaper men. This little company acted as pallbearers and carried the coffin to the receiving vault. When the vault was reached, the object of the extra size of the coffin was revealed. Holmes's dread of an autopsy haunted him constantly, and almost his last thought was to provide against such a thing being attempted. The last act in the receiving vault was performed at Holmes' express command. The lid of the coffin was taken off and the body was lifted out and laid on the ground. Then the bottom of the coffin was filled with cement. The body was then replaced in the coffin and completely covered with cement. It was Holmes' idea that this cement would harden around his body and prevent any attempt at grave robbery. The coffin was then left in the receiving vault under the guard of two watchmen who will remain on duty all night. Tomorrow afternoon, the body will be interred in a grave in the cemetery, and it is probable that at that time, religious services will be conducted by Father Daly. Holmes made no will and left no confession. 
Mr. McCann says he knows that Holmes made no will, and while the murderer this morning gave him a big bundle of papers, the lawyer says he is confident that these papers relate only to private business matters. As yet, Mr. Rattan has had no opportunity to examine them. Herman W. Mudgett, better known as H.H. H. Holmes, was one of the most conspicuous criminals of modern times. And if the murder confessions, which he has written, can only partially be believed, he was without a peer as a bloodthirsty demon. His recent ingenious confession, wherein he claimed to have killed 27 persons, was disproved, partly, at least, by the appearance of several so-called victims. But Holmes's object in making the confession was realized. The obtaining of a sum said to be $7,500, and which amount is said to have been settled upon the criminal's 18-year-old son. While the confessions have served to increase the sensationalism of the case, the only capital crime for which Holmes had to answer was the killing in this city on February 2nd, 1894 of Benjamin F. Pietzel, his fellow conspirator. The murder was committed in the dwelling, number 1316 Callow Hill Street. Holmes's conviction of murder in the first degree, the affirmation by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court of the verdict, and the recent refusal of Governor Hastings to grant a respite are so well known that a narration of the facts is unnecessary. Holmes was captured in Boston, Massachusetts, in the latter part of 1894 by Owen Hansom, the deputy superintendent of police, upon the strength of a telegram from Fort Worth, Texas, where he was wanted for horse stealing and for other charges of larceny. At that time, officials of the Fidelity Mutual Life Association of Philadelphia were hot on Holmes's trail for defrauding the concern out of $10,000 in connection with Pitizel's death the latter being insured for this amount. And as the accused believed horse stealing to be a high crime in Texas, he voluntarily confessed to Deputy Superintendent Hansom to the insurance fraud. He did not, for a moment, dream that he was suspected of the murder of Pitizel, and he came to Philadelphia without requisition papers. He expressed a willingness to be tried here on the conspiracy charges in preference to that of horse stealing at Fort Worth. Before leaving Boston, Holmes made this confession to Mr. Hanscom. And here's a quote. When I concluded it was time to carry out our scheme to defraud the insurance company, I secured a stiff in New York and shipped it in a trunk to Philadelphia. I turned the check for the trunk over to Pitizel on the Sunday nearest the 1st of September. I instructed him how to prepare the body, and in three hours, we were on our way to New York. Two days after the payment of the money, I saw Pitizel in Cincinnati. I took the three children to that city where the father saw them. Pitizel agreed to go south, and he took one child, Howard. I took the two girls to Chicago because I had business there. We all met again in Detroit. Pitizel took the children and went to South America. Sorry, this is, I'm reading an old article, not the easiest thing in the world. Pitizel took the children and went to South America. During all this time, Miss, Mrs. Pitizel knew her husband was alive but she did not know he had the children. If she was aware of that fact, she would insist that the crooked business be wound up right away. In order to keep Mrs. Pitizel away from her husband, I had to tell her he was here and there, traveling from one city to another. This was the first of a number of alleged, oh, I'm sorry. And that's the end of that quote. And then the next paragraph. 
This was the first of a number of alleged confessions that Holmes's subsequent, I'm sorry, that Holmes subsequently made. In fact, he acquired a penchant for making confessions that surprised the authorities. The insurance officials had grounds for believing Holmes had murdered Pitizel and the three children. So when the prisoner arrived in Philadelphia, he was urged to make another confession. And he did so without any, without any hesitation, but it varied somewhat from the one he made in Boston. It graphically narrated how the body was substituted for Pitizel in the Callow Hill Street house and its identification by Alice Pitizel as that of her father a week afterward. Holmes also related how the money was received from the insurance company and its subsequent division between Mrs. Pitizel, Jephthah D. Howe, the St. Louis lawyer, and himself, and it was this confession that Holmes accused Howe of receiving $2,500 for his share in the transaction. Howe was in indicted for a conspiracy, but recently the case against him was dropped. Soon after Holmes was brought to Philadelphia, Detective Geyer visited him in the county prison in relation to the finding of the body at 1316 Cowler Hill Street on September 4th, 1894. After an hour's conversation with the wily Holmes, the detective emerged from the prison with a confession in which the accused said that the body was not that of Pitizel but one substituted to defraud the insurance company. A week later, Holmes honored Mr. Geyer with another confession. Mr. Geyer, he said, that story I told you about the substituted body is not true. It is the body of Benjamin F. Pitizel, but I did not murder him or his children. On Sunday morning, September 2nd, I found Pitizel dead in the third story of the Callow Hill Street House. I found a note in a bottle telling me that he was tired of life and had finally decided to commit suicide. He requested me to look after the insurance money and took care of his wife and family. I then fixed up the body in the position it was found. These children you speak of are all right. They're with Minnie Williams in London. I gave Howard to Minnie, William in Detroit, and I sent Alice and Nellie to her from Toronto. They met Miss Williams in Niagara Falls and sailed for Europe from New York. And that's the end of that quote. Between this time and his trial for conspiracy to defraud the insurance company, to which he pled guilty, Holmes made many other confessions, but they differed very little from those already given. Each time he pretended to tell the truth, but he studiously avoided doing so. Nobody believed what Holmes said about Pitizel as he would not say anything about the children except that they were all right. In his interview with District Attorney Graham Holmes, Persi sorry, this is written weird. A lot of this is written weird, to be honest with you. I'm, I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to read it as it says, but I also have to try to speak properly here. Uh, in his interview with District Attorney Graham, Holmes persisted that he even persuaded Mr. Graham to have an advertisement in the shape of a cipher puzzle inserted in a New York paper for the purpose of bringing Minnie Williams and the Little Pitizels back from Europe. The district attorney placed little faith in what Holmes had told him. But the advertisement was published as a sort of last and hopeless effort. When the bodies of Nellie and Alice Pitizel were unearthed in Toronto, Holmes denied having killed them. When Howard's charred bones were located in a superannuated stove in Irvington, Indiana, Holmes calmly denied any knowledge of the lad's death. When the murders of Minnie Williams and her sister were discovered, Holmes said Minnie killed Nancy in a jealous frenzy, and he buried the body in Lake Michigan. 
he vigorously denied having put Minnie to death so as to secure her property. The disappearance of Emily Sigrind was traced to Holmes, but the criminal said he knew nothing of the girl's fate. The partially consumed bones that were found in the Chicago castle are known to be bones of Holmes's victims. About the last time that Holmes was taken to the district attorney's office to confess, Mr. Graham lost patience with him. Holmes gave a repetition of his picturesque falsehoods. He actually gave the district attorney a veritable jolly about the Pitazel family and Minnie Williams being still alive. The scene that ensued was extremely dramatic, Mr. Graham said. As a quote, Holmes, you are an infernal lying murderer. I will hang you in Philadelphia for the murder of Benjamin Pitazel. End quote. Holmes's nerves was still with him, and he said, as a quote, I defy you. You have no evidence to prove me guilty. End quote. Mr. Graham looked with disgust and determination at Holmes and said, as a quote, you will surely hang in Philadelphia for murdering Benjamin Pitazel, end quote. The trial and conviction followed. The district attorney endeavored to prove during the trial through the detective Geyer that Holmes had killed the Pitazel children. But Judge Arnold, before whom the case was tried, declared this to be irrelevant. Geyer had unearthed the murder of the children after a prolonged investigation and at the Commonwealth was prepared to prove that Holmes also committed these crimes. Holmes embraced the Catholic faith when it became evident to him that he must hang and Reverend Father Daly ministered to his spiritual wants. Throughout the trial and subsequent imprisonment, their arch criminal maintained a nonchalance that was remarkable. Herman Webster Mudgett was born in Gilmanton, New Hampshire, May 16, 1869. On July 4th, 1878, he married Clara A. Levering at Alton, New Hampshire, and on January 28, 1887, under the name of Harry Howard Holmes, he committed bigamy by marrying Murter Z. Belknap. A few weeks thereafter, Holmes applied in Chicago for a divorce, and the suit was pending until July 4th, 1891. When the court dismissed it, owing to the non-appearance of the complainant, Holmes continued his bigamous career by marrying Georgiana Yoke in Denver, Colorado. On January 17th, 1894, he assuming the name of Henry Mansafield Howard on this occasion. A son was born to the first wife, and this is the boy who Holmes is said to have made the chief beneficiary of the proceedings of the alleged confession of wholesale murder. Miss Yoke, with whom Holmes was living at the time of Pitazel's death, was an important witness for the Commonwealth at the trial, and it was largely upon her evidence that the accused was convicted. She told of Holmes's absence from their boarding house on September 2nd, 1894, which was the day of the murder, and of his excited condition when he returned. On that night, the couple left Philadelphia and went direct to Indianapolis. The wanderings of Holmes throughout the country then began, and they ended with his arrest at Boston. Alrighty, so that's the end of that article and it was published in the it says weekly virginian and carolinian in norfolk virginia on may 14th 1896 it was a thursday and this was on page seven so it's an interesting article you know h.h H. holmes is endlessly fascinating and so much of what's been said hasn't been true so i'm going to continue to read articles and get further information about him and adding it here because most certainly it does fit under the banner of strange history, doesn't it? I think we could all agree with that. And so 
This concludes this episode of Strange History. What do you think about H.H. H. Holmes? What do you know about him? It's uh, quite a story, isn't it? Um, if you enjoy this video, kindly like it, please share it, and subscribe to my channel. If you could become a member of this channel, it would be much appreciated. I do have exclusive content. I also have a Patreon, which you can subscribe to as well. If you want to support my research and hear more shows like this, me reading vintage books and vintage articles and just doing presentations and stuff, you can actually click on the links below, and in there you can see where you can make a donation directly to me. That would help me out a lot. If you can make a donation, you can subscribe, you can become a member, become Patreon, lots of different things you could do. Do me a favor and do yourself a favor and do the world a favor, and please be kind to other people. Be kind to humans. Um, you never know what people are going through in their own personal lives, so you know a smile is, is priceless. Also, please be kind to all non-human animals. Uh, please don't eat them. You can imagine how horrible they uh, would feel about that. You most certainly wouldn't like it. Uh, please do yourself a favor and go to a local shelter and adopt a cat or a dog. You'll be very glad that you did. Until next time, my fellow strange historians, I wish you safe travels on all your journeys.